a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today uh, we are in the episode five of the industry in plug, and we have a guest today as Mr. Samir Nagarajan, who is a CXR, CXO, and who has had thirty plus, more than thirty years of experience in the field of HR, which basically revolves around the change and transformation, organizational transformation. So uh, yeah, and also he's uh, writing currently writing a book. Which we are really hoping and waiting to read it. We get, hope it gets out really soon. So yeah, uh, sir, over to you, sir. Thank, thank you, Akshat. That was a great introduction. Yes, I'm from XLRI Jamshedpur. Did commerce before that. I've studied HR um, and 32 years in industrial relations, HR, uh, organizational behavior, but all with the theme of uh, personal and organizational change and transformation. Nice to be talking to you. Nice to be talking to you. Same, sir. So, sir, uh, we shall begin with our questions. Uh, Let's do so. Let's go. <laughs> so, the uh, first question from our audience is like, how difficult has it become for the managers globally to lead their teams in a way that they still have the same level of team spirit as it was before the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, the best leaders, I think, uh, practice the art of leadership with a great deal of humility and a great deal of connect. So if you've read this book called Level 5 Leadership, for example, and they really talk, talk about servant leadership. Uh, and I think one of the things that has defined uh, the best leaders I have worked with and uh, my own leadership style, I think, is that uh, great leaders don't just show an interest in you for the work that you do. They show an interest in you for yourself. They're interested in you as a person, as a human being. What are your strengths? What are your aspirations? And they actually put in the effort to get to know you as a person and to work with you. So I think for the best leaders, it's just been a tweak. It's been a bit of a tweak because, uh, yes, at one level, because it is about uh, as much time as I spend with you and interact with you offline. I now do that online. At another level, I think the best leaders also also show a huge amount of empathy. There is a lot of uh, stress and difficulty in life right now. I think, uh, generally speaking, the environment is constrained. You and I were just talking before this show about uh, the fact that well, even if you want to do something, you can't, or at least two months back, you could not have because the laws of the country were that well, you can't. You know, it's a lockdown, and uh, yes. so you know, adjusting to that new reality. Working from home is never simple. I think you've seen enough of the <laughs> cartoons and jokes going around about a child in the background or the dog in the background or um, or the spouse in the background, whatever it is. Um, but so I think you know a certain sense of empathy, a certain sense of humor, a certain sense of dignity, rather than uh, you know, rather than succumbing to the discomfort. So I think. Uh, for a lot of leaders, it's been a challenge. Therefore, I think some have responded to it very constructively and creatively. I hope most have responded to it constructively and creatively. At least the ones I have seen have done so. And yeah, there are always opportunities for people to learn how to do it better. So that is also there. <laughs> that is really great, sir. So like a team leader has to be empathetic. That is, I think, the basic. Yeah. Absolutely, and a lot of humility is required in the work. Um, the thing about leadership is that you don't have all the answers, uh, and you need to come across as human, but you also need to come across as someone who can confidently lead the other people into through unknown territory. Definitely, it's a, it's a very difficult balancing act. It's a very like you have to have that, uh, you know, from the inside that you can. Yeah. Do that. I think I've been fortunate to work in some very, very uh, great organizations, I would say, like Unilever uh, or Hindustan Unilever. When it comes to developing people, there's an enormous amount of work that they do in terms of, you know, working with people and through people. So there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn there, frankly. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so like a uh, next question from the guests, uh, like since you have been HR for so long and that to a uh, in an international uh, level, so I they wanted to ask what like how many transition have taken place during the uh, all these period when you have been in HR. So like uh, acceptance of different races, uh, LGBTQ community, which is the most trending as of now. So uh, how did you manage to have like transaction uh, transitions like LGBTQ uh, in the minds of the people? Did you face any challenge in this? Uh, and the, like more changing the perception or anything 
I think India is uniquely positioned in that sense. I think uh, we've been having challenges and transitions. I think almost every three years or four years or five years, there's been something or the other happening starting. And the ones I'm just speaking about my working career, the first big change I saw was liberalization in 1991. And since then, it has been, uh, you know, one one after the other. Uh, in the and, and of course, I think India is also unique in that uh, at a socio cultural political level, we have a whole lot of challenges, including, I would say, uh, the markers of you know caste and religion and uh, economy, economic uh, income you know, differentials and rural migration and uh, s- there are a lot of subsets. You know we think about gen- gender, LGBT and race come quickly to mind because these are global themes. Yes, um, I think we should never forget that India has some very very unique themes of its own. Uh, and for me, it's been very interesting that, uh, of course, different organizations react to each of these issues and uh, questions very differently. But fundamentally, I think one of the biggest success stories that India has had so far, or developing success story, if you like, is uh, gender. Uh, a lot of organizations are doing great work around gender diversity, which uh, Akshat, as you know, is a gateway diversity. So the moment you get gender right, I think when yes. you are looking at a 50% gender balance in an organization, then you are, and okay, I'm speaking in terms of the classic gender binary, which is male and female. You can argue that uh, there could be more than two genders as well, but let's just work with the classical gender binary. The moment you get the male-female gender binary right, you, most organizations report enough of a shift in culture to start looking at other forms of uh, diversity. And some of this is hard stuff, like one of the companies I worked for just said that for every position that we recruit for, Half of the candidates being shortlisted must be women. It doesn't matter what the number is. They're saying that if you are, if let's say if I am recruiting someone for the job that you are doing, I could have a shortlist of two, but in that case, one must be a woman, or I could have a shortlist of ten. In that case, five should be women. And that was so it. So, right? like there is like a bias or what? Like they are both equally capable. That, that is the case. It's just because prove. I've seen in companies that 80 percent of the candidates are women getting shortlisted and 20 percent males. I can't comment on that, but I'm telling you what the origins of this approach were. The origins of this approach yeah. went to a time when the entire shortlist would be male. And okay. the response from a, uh, from uh, from the person providing the shortlist would be that I couldn't find any women. And one of the issues uh, was that men were more easily available because they were more visible in the marketplace and, women were <laughs> visible and in some cases were not available as well. And therefore, how do you how do you force people to make the effort to go out and find women for a job? Because obviously the women are there. It's not that they're not there. Uh, in fact, uh, they have always been there. Our percentage employment of women as such in the workforce has been very high, although not in office and uh, white collar roles. So this was more to force that uh, to happen at the shortlisting stage. And this particular organization then said that decisions on hiring are on merit. So if you interview two men and two women and find that Mr. X is best suited for the job, by all means, go and offer the job to Mr. X. <laughs> but if Ms. Y is best suited for the job, then you offer the job to Ms. Y. So they just said that we'll make sure that the slate is balanced. So some of it was hard interventions of this sort. Some of it is soft cultural interventions because uh, typically all male organizations, a lot of the decision making used in some organizations used to happen after office hours. It used to happen in over socializing uh, and the typical kind of evening socializing where women don't feel welcome and don't feel included either. So a lot of it then involved culturally making the transition to say that decision making now moves back into the office. It's the same, frankly, with any form of diversity. I've seen uh, gender, I've seen race, I've seen ethnicity being tackled, I've seen uh, awareness about uh, certain other divisive issues being built up over a period of time. Uh, Some of the companies I work for have been very, very inclusive. Uh, but in all of them, I think it's a combination of hard stuff like uh, interventionist stuff and very soft cultural uh, interventions as well, which actually makes the whole thing happen. And it needs push from the top. You typically okay. have one leader who is very, very strong and very vocal and you know very irritable, saying that this has to be done and this is something I do want to see. Okay. Uh, interestingly, in some organizations, it works best when you have a target. So it's not uh, it's not the soft, easy thing of you know let's 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 go and see what we can do with this. Like, you know, Ten yes. percent of our workforce is going to be women this year, or twenty percent of our workforce is going to be women this year. 
find a way of doing it. <laughs> different organizations have different ways of approaching this problem. But I guess, I guess you're right. We have to begin from the top only because if we yeah. at the board level it is not accepted. So how will the other people yeah. or the leader is not accepted? Yeah. And to come to, to come to some of the other issues you mentioned, race, for example, is not really new in the U.S. Uh, affirmative action has been practiced for decades now. Yes. Uh, so it's, and and the U.S. is one of the countries where race uh, relations are actually you know very visible, if you like, or race differentials are very visible. Uh, I think the great thing about India, and this is most recently, I think, seen in the dialogue on LGBTQ inclusion, which is the most recent uh, thing I see is that uh, I, th I think as a country, we are very open to debate. We are very open to raising issues, tackling uncomfortable issues, considering them. And after enough of conviction has been built up, we are uh, actually quite OK to tackle them as well. So I think I am quite optimistic in terms of our ability as a country to handle some of these uh, tricky issues. Like, sir, but if, uh, like if I have to have a conversation with my parents regarding this topic, they won't even like encourage a thought and they won't even feel like, OK, this is something normal or this is like supposed like they according to uh, uh, the, the that generation that is something unconventional that is very unconventional so yeah this is not normal so how that is difficult to you know accept and change in that case to, to bring the change in that case i understand uh, so the question you really need to ask akshat is what's your goal uh, do you do you want to you know i mean one of the companies i was you know it's a very characteristic kind of saying amongst some of my friends is are you going to try and boil the ocean? won't succeed. So uh, look at it this way. You're able to have the conversation at home. That itself is a big plus, considering that most people are not, some people yes, who tell yes. you they're not okay, able okay. to have the conversation at yeah, home. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You can have the conversation at home, and you're getting a particular reaction that doesn't sit well with you. That's fine. You can at least have the conversation. So next time, have the conversation a little longer. Instead of 10 minutes, have it for 11 minutes, have it for 15 minutes. See okay. what you might you might not yeah. you have to be clear about this. People have to embrace change. You cannot yes. tell them that you cannot tell them that you must change because I am uncomfortable with you the way you are. Yeah. You're uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable. I mean, that's what yeah, we're gonna do about it. Yeah. So the question really is you work with what you have and and you move forward. I think, like I said, the great thing I think about our country is that we are able to have these conversations and they happen. You are talking about home. I can tell you it happens in offices. It happens in boardrooms. It happens in different spaces to different degrees. Yes. Kweristan um, by Parmesh Shahani, a wonderful example of what kind of different levels of dialogue are going on in different uh, organizations and different companies. He's quoted, he's named some companies. He's not named some companies and that's fine. Uh, but I think I think and, and that's just one book. There are several others. I th I'm very positive about our ability to handle change and grow as a country. <laughs> that is really great, like really great thinking. So question is like at the onset of the pandemic, when the pandemic began, like everyone was losing jobs, internships and they, LinkedIn was flooded with people seeking help. You mm. must also have received a few messages or, or post everything. So what kind of LinkedIn uh, profiles stand out and how do you, uh, you think like job seekers would approach HRs or campus recruiters on like uh, LinkedIn? It's uh, it's a good question because I think it tugs at a lot of uh, sensitivities. It raises a lot of issues. I think, uh, I don't know if you know the statistics, but in the month of March, in the month of March, uh, there's a, uh, an incredible number. I mean, I made a rough calculation. It was something like one lakh people losing their jobs every hour or something like that. Yes, uh, yes. it was uh, such data. Uh, pretty, pretty frightening kind of figure. Uh, you're quoting LinkedIn, but I'll I'll maybe maybe generalize the answer a little more. I think uh, I think first of all, if you've lost your job or if you're finding it difficult to get a job, I think the first thing to understand is that it's not your fault. Um, you could you could be a great student, you could be a great employee, you could be a great manager. You've lost your job. That's it. It's got nothing to do with your qualifications. It's got nothing to do with your competence. If the business takes a hit, the business takes a hit. Some businesses can sustain, but the reality is that very few in the overall scheme of things, very few businesses can sustain. You know, 
six months without cash and three months without uh, orders and you know nine months without manufacturing all that is it's it's, it's uh, incredible so i think in that case what you do is uh, first build resilience easier said than done but your mental health your emotional health your spiritual health your physical health i think the first thing you need to need to do is to take care of yourself and then i mean this is going to be a fast answer because each of these could take a lot of time to discuss and explain although i'm happy to do that if you want me to but uh, then reach out to as many people as you can i think uh, linkedin for example was very helpful they uh, they introduced this feature called open to work so you can tag your profile as open to work and they uh, i think they went overdrive trying to promote jobs uh, uh, as a platform and made it free for uh, advertisers to post jobs for a while and so on a lot of a lot of people with a high number of links like uh, like me and a few others have also been posting jobs sent to us by others so let's say if com- someone in company x writes to me and says put this onto your network i'm looking for a finance guy or i'm good looking for a marketing guy I just put it on there and say contact mr x because because my network is large enough and there are enough people yes, who are who are actually uh, looking for jobs but the bottom line is therefore reach out to as many friends as you can reach out to as many consultants as you can um there's a whole lot of stuff going around for free now so you know how to write a cv how to write a resume um i would suspect someone of your age would know it much better than me but you know using uh, using hashtags and using the uh, using the words that are used in a job post and not not trying to use your own language so therefore if the job says you need experience in learning and development then well you say that you don't say training and development then you say learning and development and that's just a simple example so i think uh, use all the there's a lot of online learning there's a lot of free learning at a time like this it was much more i think in april and may one had the luxury of choice right i mean i used to choose which webinars to attend and which uh, conferences to online conferences to go and so on it was a lot of fun because most of it was free but uh, but i think use that network get around a bit and i think uh, hope for the best factors i think uh, i use i always use process metrics in a case like this so i don't say i don't you know it's very depressing if you ask if if i come to you every day and say how many you know have you got a job yet uh, it's yes it's, definitely but so much easier to say how many interview calls did you get today how many emails did you send out today how many how many companies have you reached out to how many recruiters have you reached out to today now there you start giving people a sense of achievement all right i reached out to 10 people yesterday kuch to hoga na yes sir something will come of it it may take time it may take a week 10 days that's okay as long as you're doing 10 every day you're sending 10 emails every day or five emails every day you're, you're okay you'll you'll get there sooner or later and i can't emphasize this enough the economy will bounce back ultimately economies are fundamentally resilient creatures they it may last for a while the downturn may last for a while but it will come back to normal soon i don't think there is a, i don't know what the soon is to be quite <laughs> honest uh, but uh, although you know your your nightmares and pessimism might tell you that you know everything looks black as of now that's not really the case things will okay. get better yeah? thank you so much sir last, last of all if anyone has needs any help i think uh, there are enough and more people on uh, linkedin and other fora who are coaches who are counselors who are therapists who can always listen to you and help you as an any student uh, listen and help you understand get a bit of perspective on what's happening thank you so much sir thank you sir. So, so a last question for the day is uh, what are the some of the basic resistance to change in a company like why do people resist change in general and any real life example uh, you could uh, cite in this case that would really be helpful there are as many reasons to resist change as there are people so if an organization has 100 people you got 100 reasons to resist change already <laughs> uh fundamentally i mean of course the way resistance to change expresses itself is very different but uh, the person who looks for whether people are openly opposing it or silently opposing it and the people who are more difficult to deal with are the ones who are silently opposing it open opposition is good it's like making a sale when yes. someone starts asking you questions then you know that they are engaging with the product so as long as you answer the objections properly the sale will happen Yes, at least you could know the thought process going in in someone's mind. Exactly, exactly. Whereas, uh, in uh, if the person is not engaging at all, if you're trying to sell me something and I say, "Ha, huh, actually, very good, very good." Now I think I'll go for my next. <laughs> you know that 
not only am I not going to buy the product, I'm not even interested, I'm not even talking about it. Uh, but that said, the second biggest thing that works is uh, either I must gain from, uh, from what is happening in terms of change in some way. So it need not necessarily be a financial gain or a material gain. It could be a prestige gain. It could be an image gain. It could be an acceptability gain. It could simply be that the Times of India will write about it tomorrow saying that a fantastic job happened. And that might mean a lot for me personally. Yes, or, I must, or I must not lose something. One of the two has to happen. <laughs> So one is saying that something will increase. The other is saying something will not decrease. So I think the second one, uh, latter one is like more uh, preferable. Like at least we shouldn't lose out of uh, the change. Well, I mean, let me tell you what the difference is. If the house is on fire, you must go out now. You must not lose your life. <laughs> so at least you will not lose. Yes, but uh, you have to, if you have to, let's say, redo the electrical wiring in your house okay, yeah. then you have to be clear about itna paisa jayega itna effort hoega so much of discomfort now what will i get at the end of it put in a business context what that means is that if you don't adopt for example uh, digital and e-commerce tools you will you might actually end up out of business so that's simply in order to stay where you are you'll need to at least understand a little bit about how the digital and e-com system works Yes, However, if you want to beat the big boys at their game, then you need to be a master of digital. Yeah. Therefore, then it becomes, what am I going to gain from doing this? And I think uh, the challenge of leadership is one is to communicate these benefits or these risks in a palatable way because you don't want to threaten someone. No? You don't want to say that you lose your job if you don't do this. I mean, that's that's not leadership. It's like you know, simple bargaining and transactions would give you that. Uh, but the other thing is, of course, in most successful change programs is what I said about leadership. I don't know how I'm going to take you from here to there. But I'm the leader and it's my job to take you from here to there. Yes, sir. I say I don't know. I don't know fully. I don't know every last detail. Now, I, you need to trust me enough to hold my hand and walk with me. And trust that if something happens on the way, I won't let go of your hand. And I think that is a quality that leadership exerts during change and transformation uh, processes. Um, let me give you a can we give you an example of one country that I worked in where sure. the, business had, uh, the business had only one factory. And, uh, and this is not in India. This was in another country I was in. The business had only one factory there. It was so therefore the entire sales and or 60 percent of the sales and a very large amount of the profitability depended on this factory. And there was a fire in the factory. It was a devastating fire. It was not a small fire. Okay. And fortunately, no one got hurt. No one died. We don't know. Uh, well, I mean, the cause of the fire was whatever it was. Might have been an accident or it's not relevant to our discussion. But then uh, <laughs> there was a palpable mood of gloom and despair after that because it was early in the year. It was uh, March, April, which means you had nine months of the year to go and uh, you were looking at the place which had 60% of your sales being burnt down. And there was a sense and the insurers were very clear, the engineers were very clear, it would take at least two years for the factory to be rebuilt. It was so badly damaged. And I think we were all prepared to, I think as a management team, we were initially, there was a mood of gloom and despondency across the company in terms of, you know, we, this year is gone. Our sales are going to be rotten. Our competition is going to do much better. Therefore, our increments will be bad. Our, no, this part, no one will tell you, but there's, you know, obviously it's at my, <laughs> my increments and so on. I think the CEO and the board in this case took a very, very uh, uh, considered stance and uh, worked behind the scenes to set up alternate manufacturing capacity inside the country, set up import routes from to get supplies from other countries into this particular country, immediately reached out to consumers aggressively and said, we are still around. We are in the marketplace and your brands, your products are available. Uh, tell, let us know what you think of them. And immediately then said, this is going to be very, very difficult because you know you need to learn a whole lot of skills as well there's one set of skills involved in manufacturing in one plant and distributing inside a country yes. there's a very different set of skills around imports logistics air transport sea transport costing everything becomes different your margins take a hit yes that's what you use to manufacture next to and sell at a margin of say 25 percent 
you are now selling at a much reduced margin and probably at a higher selling price as well. Yes, sir. lots of reassurances required to consumers, to internal employees, the sales force, the manufacturer. When you do all this, your manufacturing employees think that their jobs are going to be hit because if you're importing from outside, it means you might not need this factory anymore. So there's another separate set of communications there. I'm very pleased. To, it was difficult, uh, but it was very uh, challenging and it gave me a lot of pleasure to look back on it because I think a year to 14 months down the line, morale was back. People were back on their feet and saying, OK, let's make a success of this. We know that this model works. We, there is proof of concept. The year did not go as badly as we thought it was. Uh, it would go and things got better. So I think uh, you know, there is a lot that can be done on change and transformation, even in adverse situations of this sort. That is really great. So thank you so much for the, all the answers. Uh, they were really good. And I think our students will be really happy to see the video when it comes out. Uh, thank you so much. Sir. Thank you once again. Thank you, Akshat, and thank you to all your students as well.